Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you are listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds But we will get started on today's episode, where I will be talking to one Sabrina Brando. Sabrina is Director of Animal Welfare with the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. She has been working globally with and in zoos and aquariums for 26 years. Sabrina is a psychologist and has a Master's in Animal Studies. She is additionally the owner of Animal Concepts, a consulting company in animal welfare, care and behaviour. Sabrina is passionate about animals and focusing on promoting positive animal welfare, good human interactions and relationships, as well as the importance of caring about and for the natural world. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Sabrina to the ATA podcast show today, who's patiently waiting by. Sabrina, how are you? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm well, thank you. Hey, so excited to have you on the show with us. We got to meet, when was that? Earlier this year in Wellington, New Zealand. In May, you came, yes. You came to my hometown. We were very lucky to have you here. and We had a lot of fun Yes, together. it was a delight, absolutely. It was really, really nice to be at the Wellington Zoo for the Animal Welfare Workshop, and it was great to meet you there. Although it was a bit cold, I remember. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's right. I do remember that. That's. I mean, that's. I remember that, but that's kind of pretty standard for Wellington. Uh, but anyway. yes, that was lovely to be around the penguins. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah. We've got that video, don't we? We should share that. Maybe we can share that video in the podcast write-up that you and I made together with the penguins in the background. With lovely yeah, animal keeper, Barney, uh, cleaning the penguin pond in the background. I have to make sure <laughs> Barney listens to this. Hey, let's dive in to the first question today, Sabrina. Could you please start off this episode by telling everyone listening why learning and training is relevant to animal welfare? Yes. So some years ago, I visited the zoo in the Netherlands. And when I visited there, I had a really nice tour by one of the caregivers. And he said, we don't really do a lot of training here, but uh, I'm happy to show you all the animals. And as the day drew a close and it was five o'clock and we went to see all the animals and the animals were being closed in for for the night, which is quite common practice in zoos. There was a big field with wallabies and some emus. And the caregiver, you know, the emus started walking up and the caregiver kind of signals, you know, with his hand and he says, wait to the emus and they stand there. And then he calls out wallabies. And then suddenly this whole troop of wallabies comes running over the field and he opens this door and everyone runs into this barn and he closes the door and then he looks at the emus and... He goes, okay, emus, and he opens another door and all the emus walk in and he closes the door. And I think, yes, no training. And I think that's, you know, when we think about animal welfare, animal welfare really revolves around the, the not just the, the, the physical and physiological aspects, but also the psychological aspects of the animals and, and how they're experiencing their environment. And of course, when we care for the animals, we try to find ways to, to manage them and interact with them in positive ways. And this was just such a great example of how animals learn all the time, even if we don't necessarily think they do. 
And we have been training them or are training them for all kinds of behaviors that are making it, making it easy to care for them, like, you know, calling animals to just come to us and to walk into the areas where we want them to be. And so, you know, for me, when I think about why learning and training is relevant to animal welfare, it's about, you know, of course, being cognizant of the fact that animals learn all the time and also making sure that we understand how they learn and what they learn. And if we see problem behaviors, where might they be coming from, of what might they have learned of these signals that are out in, in the environments for them or the consequences so for me, you know, for example, this this example of the of the wallabies and emus is just a a great you know way to illustrate you know animals learn all the time. We're training and working with them to manage them, and you know if we do this in this way, which is, was very positive, the animals had a choice because they were being called. They didn't have to come running to the to the caregiver, but they did, and they did go inside. And so the learning uh, and the training that happened there was positive for them, and they uh, and it makes us caring for them easier. So it, it promotes these positive animal welfare experiences. And, and this is just one of the many examples I can give on how animal learning and training is relevant to welfare and, and being aware of that. Can you potentially offer us a couple more examples whilst we're talking on this particular subject? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so if we think about animal welfare from a day-to-day -day basis, for example, if I walk into uh, an area where maybe there's a, uh, lots of different animals inside and everyone is running to the back, that tells me something about what the animals are experiencing, how they perceive what might or might not be happening. So it might be the person that is new, but it might also be that, you know, I see also, unfortunately, that many animals are afraid of the animals that actually care of the people that care for the animals. So being, you know, cognizant of the fact that if you see this happening, then how do we react to that? If I see animals running away from a person or only running away from the veterinarian, or and I always feel for the veterinarians because they got into this profession because they love animals, they want to care for them, and then most animals really don't like the veterinarian. But, you know, making an opportunity there that the veterinarian maybe comes in and feeds the animals or gives enrichment to the animals or just spends some time around the animals so the animals can learn learn other things about the veterinarian than just being that person who comes to maybe dart them or inspect them or transport them. So that could be uh, some of the other examples. But, you know, if we see things happening, then how do we react to that? So if we see animals moving to the back and they're always looking around of what might be happening, then that is for us a responsibility and an opportunity to make it better to say, so how are we going to use animal training or animal learning in a broader context to make it better so that animals are appropriately habituated to people to the caregivers to generalize that across to other uh, people that they might not know or visitors um, it could also be you know teaching animals to participate in all kinds of husbandry behaviors whether it's sitting on the scale so we can weigh them opening their mouths so we can in, in you know look at their teeth and gums or maybe take um, a swap or something if we need to there's lots and lots of behaviors that we can work with uh, the animals so that we can actually manage them on a daily basis. And I'm sure that in other podcasts that you've heard many other examples of this kind. But if we look from a broader perspective, when I think about animal learning and training with regards to being relevant to welfare, what really comes to mind is something that we have outlined in our 24-7 Across Lifespan paper. And that, that paper revolves around looking at animals their whole day. So not just the time that I'm at the zoo or at the aquarium, or you could think, you know, I'm at home with my dog or the, where the, the horse is living in the stable. But, and so really looking at not just the time that you are with the animals, but what is their 24-7 like? What are the animals? What can they do? What choices can they make? What type of control do they have? 
especially also in the hours that you're not there. So within this paper, we, for example, talk about habitat management and environmental complexity. And habitat management is actually something that comes from the domain of ecology and looking at, so what are the aspects that are important for a particular species or for a particular individual to really do well in this environment and to really, you know, thrive? So if I look at zoo animals, I could ask questions about, Okay, so if we have to bring animals in in the night, then of course I can train them to do that. But once they're inside, what type of opportunities do they have? Um, so Hal Markowitz, for example, in his book, uh, Behavioral Enrichment, uh, he talks about, you know, different types of devices that animals could operate with coins. So they could get an exchange for food or they can interact with, with people. So it's really thinking about, so how can training and learning help for animals to, for example, get access to food in the time that we are not there? And that could, of course, also be done by timers, uh, but it could also be done by devices where animals can get access to food or maybe can choose in what type of uh, exhibit or area they want to be or with who they want to be by activating uh, light sensors. If they want more light or if they want to have uh, warmth, they can go into another place and they can activate that or they can switch it off. So, for example, we put on lots of music when we cleaning because we like to, you know, just have something around uh, and it makes it not so silent and it makes the work easier. But do animals actually like music? music. So if I talk about welfare and, and training, uh, could I have a way of animals signaling that they actually don't like that particular music? Maybe they like some other sounds or maybe they like it off. And some of the few studies that have been done where animals got the choice to decide what sounds they wanted to hear, most of them actually turned it off. So again, you know, if we're talking about welfare from a broader perspective and really talking about like giving animals choices and control, then what does that mean in practice? How do I, you know, use animal learning and, and, and training animals or, or animals training me to give them that voice to let them decide what they want and when they want it? Uh, so, for example, you know, cows have been taught to press a lever so they can activate a shower. And so, of course, if, if there was one cow that was using the shower like 18 hours of the day. And of course, that immediately signals to us that there might actually be some physiological problem uh, with this animal because you wouldn't expect that. But we do know uh, that animals do like to maybe, you know, activate particular aspects, whether it's environmentally uh, with regards to temperature or humidity or whether it is, um, you know, being able to access other companions or maybe requesting a training session with a particular trainer of their choice. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So there's just, for me, there is this really, we talk about choice and control all the time. They're like these buzzwords in animal welfare. But then, you know, if if training is that is the dialogue that, that Susan Friedman and, and many others use, if it's, it's a, if it's a true dialogue, then how do we build in, how do we use animal learning and training to then build in the opportunities for animals to tell us in various ways, ways they could be going places, they could be pressing levers, they could be, you know, using a vocalization, whatever, you know, is, is salient, whatever is relevant to the species to communicate what it is uh, that they want and how they want it. And I think a beautiful example is also Elsa Paulser uh, writes in one of her books, um, about how she has this communication with this po with this polar bear who wants the bedding his the nesting material changed but only a certain part of it and it's the posturing of the animal and where the animal is uh, that kind of signals to her what he wants and when he wants it and where he wants it and it's to me those things are very interesting so to really look from the broader perspective of how do we get that communication with the animals uh, to try try and understand what it is, uh, what they want and, and how they want it and all the other aspects. So, yeah, it's not just a one-to-one -one training session to, to weigh the animal or to move an animal or to get a show or a presentation or an education program going, but it's really looking at the details. How can I make sure that you have a great day every day? And, and if I'm not there, then how do I make sure that you have opportunities 
that you that create choice and control, real choice and control for you when I'm not there to care for you. And this is as much true for a, a horse in a stable as a dog at home or, or a lion or a parrot um, in a zoo or an aquarium. I want to go back a little bit there to... There was, there was a lot of things I want to go back to, but, but let's let's start at the start. Um, so you talked about physical and, and psychological welfare, uh, and you talked about examples like vets coming in and showing animals that it's not always bad things that happen when I'm here. Sometimes good things happen too. Um, is I'm just thinking about some of the feedback I get, and you mentioned it there. People say they don't have time, so we, how, do, how can we be more resourceful and use the time that we do have to achieve these things? Actually, we haven't talked about that because that's what you and I were talking about before we push record. We're going to talk about it, everyone. <laughs> uh, but do, do you find that a lot, that the vets might say to you, or, or you might hear other people reporting this, that they don't have time, so they're not doing these types of things. And and then in, in, in your role in the zoo world, how do we, you know, what kind of uh, uh, resources, I'm trying to think of the right word here, resources isn't the right word, but tools do we um, have to kind of model welfare uh, and how we might think about providing for both those physical and psychological welfare needs? And, and so when we're saying we don't have time, you know, what, what are we using in, in the zoo world specifically to kind of say, here's what we have to think about when we're thinking about that holistic view of welfare for our animals. So we're touching base on the physical and psychological aspects. Does that question make sense? Yes. So, for example, with regards to time, time is often given as an obstacle. And it's true that training can take a lot of time, depending on what you want to train and how you want to do it. So... Training can be, I think, anything from I'm going to use this carrot and and I'm you know going to put it on the scale. And then if the rhino or, well, carrots and rhinos is really actually quite a bad example because we need to use species, you know, appropriate food. And, and food is something that, you know, I'm going off on the tangent now, but we need to make sure that when we train, we use uh, you know, species appropriate food. So I'm going to, you know, remove the carrot actually, and I'm going to say I'm going to use any food that is relevant to the species uh, so that what they eat on a daily basis. So I might use grasses to get the rhino to come to the to the scale and I feed the animal uh, for being on the scale and that's it. I'm not going to, you know, use a particular target because my hand with the grass is like the target and the animal comes is already feeding from the hand. He's comfortable or she's comfortable doing that. I'm just going to hold it where the scale is. The animal doesn't seem to have any problem problems with it uh, I get the weight the rhino gets the grass and everyone's happy and that's training done it doesn't need to be more difficult than that and training can be also very complex in the sense that I might have an animal who is old or who has particular um physiological constraints that I cannot just anesthetize the animal. So the trainers, the caregivers might work with the veterinarian to actually train the animal to accept a local anesthesia injection to then wait for about 30 minutes for this to work and to then talk the animal through a 45 minute operation locally by removing maybe a little uh, spot or maybe having to do a biopsy and all this under control. So training, I think, again needs to be seen as something that can be something that can be done very quickly as well as taking lots of time depending on what the what the needs are of that individual or also what the needs are of that particular facility but animals learn all the time so for example animals might have learned that if i go inside yes there is food but i also get maybe locked inside and I actually don't want to go inside yet. I might want to go inside and I'm comfortable going inside, but I only want to go inside when I want to go inside. And this is also a very common problem that I see in zoos and sanctuaries and many other f- facilities where we call the animals and it might take you half an hour or 45 minutes or even longer before they even show up. And so that is a lot of time that we lose on a daily basis. If you calculate, for example, I've seen this in many places, how often people say, okay, I try, well, you know, I'll go and do something else. I'll come back in half an hour. A lot of that also is extremely time consuming. So you could also argue that, you know, if you train animals to come on a recall on various times of the day, 
and they do that, you know, comfortably and they're not always being locked in, but there's all kinds. And if they're locked in, there's lots of opportunities for them and, and fun things happening because, of course, we're always asking, so why why does it take so long for them to come inside or why are they not necessarily motivated to, to do something? And there could be something out there that, that they want more or there could be something that is aversive in the place that they want to go. But we could look at how much time do we actually lose when we're waiting and when we're trying to get behaviors from the animals that they're not willing to give us yet. So I think, you know, we also need to be quite honest with looking at those aspects critically and seeing where can we, you know, are we actually using our time most efficiently? But I would also argue more importantly is that what we're trying to, what our responsibility and duty is to animals that we house is to make sure that they have a good time and they are happy with whatever it is that happens to them, whether it's in the outdoor areas or in the indoor areas. And so I think we have a duty to invest time to make these behaviors enjoyable for them, that they want to do them uh, when we need to do them, uh, when we need that from them. But I think the time argument can be dismissed i think on a lot of levels not just on the economics of the time that is used by the keepers by waiting and so on but very much also on the fact that we want to promote predominantly positive welfare for the animals in our care wherever they are and so you know it's our duty to make sure that we do invest that time and then of course we can think about okay so if they're learning all the time so how do am i how am i going to set up these learning these training uh, aspects when i'm cleaning when i'm feeding when i'm walking around from one area to another so how can i use that time most effectively um tim sullivan who is an excellent animal trainer at the uh, brookfield zoo he has this example of you know this whiteboard where people you know they could just write on as they were walking from one area to the other just to get some behavioral you know observations or where animals were spending time and i think you know if we think about how we work around the animals with all the all the things that we need to do we can start to think of well if i walk from this side to that side if i have a pouch and i have some treats with me if animals are in areas where i would like them to be I can just walk over and give them a treat or I can launch a treat depending on what the animal who the animal is and in what ways you're working with them so I think we have to become creative in seeing how can we use our time best and how can we fit it in into our in our in our busy lives because I completely understand I've worked as an animal caregiver for 15 years myself so I know it's a very busy job we have many things to do but we have to become creative in finding the time uh, to solve it so I've also worked in teams where we didn't all go to lunch at the same time uh, because that would be a whole hour you know that we were all away so we broke up our team in two teams and so we had one hour more a day to then train with the animals or do behavior observations or do other activities for the animals so I think there's a lot of different tools out there for us um, and one of the things that we really need to do is to critically analyze what have animals already learned what are animals learning when we are cleaning, feeding and doing all the other things? So not just the one to one training session, but really thinking in the broader perspective and uh, and, you know, how can we maximize the the use of our time most efficiently? Also, because I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have a lot of behaviors that have been learned, like, for example, waiting behaviors um, or pacing behaviors or other, you know, maybe touching the, the door because animals are expecting at a certain point to be fed or a certain point to go inside. So many things are already in place. And some of it, we actually, in a way, have to get animals to unlearn them because they it's actually not desirable for that individual to engage in those behaviors. And so, you know, it's, it's really looking at how, what are we doing? What type of methods do we have? have in place and what needs changing uh, and what is positive and, and should st uh, stay. And so <clears throat> to help us out with this, I thought I had it in my drawer. I'm going to show you. No one's going to be able to see it because they can only hear us. But I've, I've got the Waza conservation strategy in my drawer. I thought I had the welfare strategy, but I don't. But <laughs> I do have it somewhere in this mess that is behind my camera. Um, but can, can you tell people about this this document that's available freely online for people to go and access? Because we, we in, in the zoo industry have a whole 
I don't know what you want to label it as, manual, guide, document, strategy. Uh, about strategy, doing this, don't we? Yeah. Strategy is a great word. We have a whole strategy. We have a, a booklet that people can download that walks us through this on a deep level. Can you can you tell people about this? Absolutely. Yeah. So the World Associations of Zoos and Aquaria is a membership organization. And regional and national zoo associations like ZA in, in uh, Australasia, uh, CISA, um, the, South East, the Southeast Asia uh, Zoo Association, uh, but also AZA in, in North America, EASA, there's ALPSA, there's, there's JASA, there's all these very zoo associations and many uh, of them are very active in having all kinds of documentation. And, and of course with WASA we have two strategies, one is the conservation one and one is the welfare one. And the welfare strategy was published in 2015. It has nine different chapters and it revolves around the five domain model, which was written by uh, Professor Meller and, and others. And the five domain model revolves around animal welfare, looking at four physical domains and one mental domain. So looking at the environment and nutrition and behavior <clears throat> And also looking at the mental domain as in, you know, the positive and negative experiences that animals can have. So positive experiences could be joy and play and curiosity and, and interaction and exploration. And the negative aspects could be fear and anxiety and boredom. And all these five domains together say something about the welfare of the animal. And within this strategy, we talk about, uh, you know, at the importance of animal welfare assessments. And that also you could you could take that from like what our animals lives like like 24 7 around the clock but you could also see okay animal welfare assessment in a training session so you can use it really you know from like a broad perspective to very specifically what questions do we ask when we're training animals and what um, behaviors or vocalizations or other aspects are we looking at when animals are being trained and what is the environment that they're they're being kept in uh, when they're being trained different from maybe where they're normally housed? And so there's all these various chapters that really talk about the tools that we have available, environmental enrichment, appropriate design, but also looking at, you know, breeding and and other programs that we have, conservation programs. So how do we make sure that if we have animals in breeding programs, that we also look at the individual welfare because the breeding programs revolve around population management and species. But then how do we make sure that the individual animal is having a good time? So if we are training animals to go into a crate instead of just capturing them when they need to be transported maybe to another zoo or aquarium for a breeding program, that I think is a refinement and how we do things. And the strategy gives us uh, some of the tools. But as I mentioned also, the national and regional zoo associations around the world have other great documents, whether it's on you know animals in presentations or how we interact with animals. Uh, and so there's lots of documentation available freely online for zoo professionals, also in different languages, because of course here we're speaking English, but we have to be very cognizant of the fact that many other people do not necessarily speak or read in English so we have to make sure it's available in many languages for people to really look at what is what what do we mean when we talk about animal welfare and how does that then you know reflect in the various different programs that we develop and one of those is the animal training uh, and then specifically when I say animal training is the one-to-one -one or the one to the group or multiple trainers or whatever different combinations you could have but that's just one of the tools that we have when we're caring for animals. And so we'll, we'll link to the WASA welfare strategy and we'll link to the WASA website as well because am I correct, Sabrina, that via the WASA website people can find all of the member uh, organisations around the world and then they can therefore move on to find all the links to all the other documents? Absolutely, yes. And I think what is really important to note that when we talk about animal welfare and also animal training is to really look uh, from an interdisciplinary approach. So... A lot of the animal welfare assessment frameworks or thinking about animal welfare have come from the farm animals. And I and some of the really interesting 
you know, opportunities that maybe we've had to interact with animals and training have also come from laboratory animals or from dog training or, you know, that that horses can use symbols to to say, I want the blanket on or I want the blanket off to the people that care for them, whether they're going to be colder or whether they feel warm. Uh, some of that comes maybe from the learning that we have maybe first learned about from primates. And we thought, oh, they use symbols and they can do choices how about we try this with horses and so it's extremely important for us to keep always looking and thinking interdisciplinary to really see what are people doing in the animal welfare field in in all domains and how what i see people doing with dogs how is that maybe relevant to when i work with a lion or with a parrot or with a with a with a fish uh, or how is it not and but we really have to look from an interdisciplinary approach, both from the research side as best practice, uh, the practical experiences. You know, when I say interdisciplinary approach, it's also very much uh, looking at, at your own discipline. So if you're working with chimpanzees or if you're working with parrots, um, or if you're working with uh, lions, then to really look at what what do we know about these animals in the wild, and how is that Im- information important when I'm designing environments for animals that are housed under human care, and also if we know that people are doing research uh, on, for example, in zoos like Edinburgh Zoo has lots of cognition research going on with squirrel monkeys and with chimpanzees, and we under- we get understandings on abstract learning perhaps then how can that information be used to you know create even more interesting environmental enrichment programs or training programs how can i use the knowledge that is available in science to make more interesting uh, training programs so for example if once an animal has done the correct behavior i might use uh, a bridge or not depending on where the animal is and then instead of me deciding what type of reward they get i might put different rewards out and they can choose what reward they want so i might have several rewards in front of them and so uh, as soon as they take that particular reinforcer then i can remove the rest but i could take that even further by saying i know that you understand uh, and can form abstract concepts so how about all high energy behaviors are grouped under this particular symbol and all husbandry behaviors are grouped under this particular symbol and i also have different symbols for different trainers uh, or caregivers and then you know i can give you various options and as, as a good animal professional i know how many husbandry sessions i need to do to maintain behavior at at a good level so I can manage the animals appropriately or give them physical exercise. Uh, But I can show these various symbols to, for example, a dolphin. We tried this. So then they can choose, okay, I want to work with this particular trainer. So again, when we're talking about the dialogue uh, and giving animals choices and control is to, to see, so how do what we know through science, how can that create opportunities for us to add in more options for animals to really make choices about what they want to do and and who they want to work with that day. Because as as animal caregivers and trainers, we are often the ones that decide which animal we're working with. So why shouldn't animals be, why should the dolphin or that particular parrot not be able to choose what trainer they want to work with and you know every time i i give this example or i want to try this you know a lot of people are quite apprehensive about it because of course they'll say well what if the animal doesn't choose me you know and i'm like yeah you know that that's a chance of course but you know if we're saying this is a dialogue and animals should have choices then why should they not for example be able to choose who they want to work with and um you know and of course it doesn't mean that they sometimes they they might get a choice offered that you know just like on the airline we're sorry if your you know preference isn't available today so maybe you you give uh, them choices that is not necessarily their preference preference but they still have some choices so it's really again I to- keep talking about refinement a lot and and it's a way that comes uh, we talk about refinement a lot in laboratory animals for for different reasons but I think the word applies very much so to you know our animal medicine 
management and care programs is to, so how do we do the things we do and are they the best that they can be? Are, are we actually adding in those details that can make a difference? And then, of course, you need, you know, research and, and feedback and monitoring to see whether the things that you are offering are indeed enriching, are making a difference, are, you know, promoting positive welfare. We can't just assume that. How do we do the things we do and how can they be the best that they can be? So I'm getting the feeling that you're very um, all about asking good questions, asking quality questions. And and the other thing I took away from everything you've just said then, and I'm going to quote my good friend uh, and one of my mentors, Nick Bishop, who uh, when we were working together a couple of weeks ago in Melbourne said, resourcefulness is our ultimate resource. So asking good questions, and, and you, you said there a lot, being creative. They, they were my two big takeaways from a lot of things you just said then, is asking how can we do this better and, and then being resourceful with what we have available to, to provide the animals what they need. Is, is that a really simplified um, but somewhat accurate summary? No, absolutely, of, uh, yes, absolutely. It's really looking at, you know... So sometimes we we will say things I know and I know we briefly spoke about that uh, before, but I, I always want to make sure is what I know indeed correct? And there's many ways of knowing also. Uh, and I think that for me, the, the welfare workshop in Wellington was beautiful in many regards, not just from science, but also to the opportunity to speak some to some of the the Maori people that were there about different ways of knowing. And I think it's a beautiful con- combination of combining science with many other things uh, and other methodologies to understand what we think we know. So if I want to know something and want to make sure that what the animal, or, or not sure, because we can never be sure, sure, but we can try and come as close as possible, is to keep asking, is what I know still relevant? Is it still correct? Is it still appropriate for this individual as things change so again it's not just about you know today but really across time and and to keep asking that question um you know is what i know is what i what i feel how is that you know being evaluated what methods do i use to make sure that i'm doing the best uh, that i think is for this species and for this particular individual particularly for the individual of course because animal welfare is about individuals and um and also making sure that, again, you know, I'm, I'm looking from my position is that there's so much knowledge, whether it's scientific knowledge or or experience knowledge by if, if lots of people like in my master thesis, almost every marmoset caregiver that I talked to talked about smiling eyes as a positive welfare indicator. You know, I said, so how do you know your your marmosets are happy? And they would say they, they have smiley eyes. And of course, you know, from a science perspective, you go smiley eyes. What does that mean? But if so many people talk about smiling eyes, then it must be something in the facial expression of that animal that is different when they are maybe fearful or so on. And we know, you know, that that animals have can have different facial expressions. But we constantly do have to keep asking about what do we know and how do we know it? And is it still, you know, appropriate? Is it still correct? Uh, and not become complacent or accepting that that's just how things are. Uh, because many of the things that we do today are based in traditions, are based in long, you know, ways of working that are not right for animals. So we, for everything we do, we have to keep asking, is this the best? Are we the best that we can be, as the president of the WASA Council says, Dr. Jenny Gray? And absolutely being resourceful, being creative, trying to find solutions. And I I love these workshops where you or these brainstormings or whatever you want to call them, um, where you can't say no. Yeah, so you're not allowed to say no. You have to. You have to. We have to focus on creating in, uh, solutions. We have to try to focus on looking for opportunities. There's no point in in a dead end. Uh, it's that creativity, that resourcefulness, is to really look at where can we make a difference because we we most of the time can't. I love that. I love that. We can't say no. I'm going to try that. We use the uh, say yes and from borrowed from theatre sports, I believe. I yeah, borrowed it from me too. Absolutely. That was taught to me by my good friend Chad Criddle at Adelaide Zoo. Just want to give him the credit for that, teaching me yes and. Thank you, Chad. 
Hey, we talked about Waza a lot, uh, and since August 2017, you have been working with Waza as the director of, you're going to have to help me out with your exact title because I've deleted it from my notes in front of me, director of... Animal Welfare. Director of Animal Welfare. Easy, I should have known that. Director of Animal <laughs> Welfare. Can you tell everyone listening what you do? What What does the World Association of Zoos and Aquarium Animal Welfare Director do? Yes, so it's a brand new position. We have many new positions within the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria. We have a director of conservation and communication and membership and an operations director. And we, we all, you know, work together, you know, revolving, of course, around these two big strategies that you mentioned earlier in conservation and welfare. And in my particular job, it's, as I mentioned earlier, also WASA is a membership organization. So I work very much with uh, associations, uh, working groups in animal welfare uh, that are within the associations. We, of course, was a, we have an animal welfare committee, so we work on all kinds of different issues from the complaints that we get from mostly non-member uh, zoos. So that also means the um, WASA has national and regional association members and they have their own members but most of the complaints that we get for example or animal welfare concerns are from facilities that are not a member of any of them and we try to of course respond to those where we can my work has lots of different lines i i've been working on the cites working group for confiscated specimens there's as many of you know extreme illegal wildlife trading there's lots of problems with animals being confiscated some animals cannot be returned to the home country so we need to find appropriate destinations for these individuals in sanctuaries in zoos many zoos uh, take animals from the illegal wildlife trade so we work very closely with other organizations we have specifically to welfare uh, all kinds of connections with uh, also universities that have welfare uh, programs we work together with regards to conferences or events that revolve around animal welfare we work very much on making sure that all national and regional zoo associations have animal welfare assessment processes in place and one of those goals is set at 2023 so really making sure that you know all all associations are doing some form of animal welfare assessment. And of course, as we are supporting our members, one way we also try to set uh, visions for where we want to go in the future. Um, so maybe some associations are revolving around input based so resources, things that we provide to animals, but then we need to still look at animal-based parameters to see whether what we provide animals is indeed resulting in, in good welfare and positive experiences for animals. Not just because we are you know, giving animals uh, environmental enrichment, it means that those activities are indeed enriching. So from the input, we need to go to the animal-based parameters. And so assessments, some of them revolve very much now on input resources, and so the vision then would be to for the associations to make sure that we're moving to animal-based assessments so in my in my job it's very much collaborative i'm constantly in contact with different associations with working group with committees we work on all kinds of different aspects um, that have to do with welfare but we also i work very closely with uh, martin zordan who is our director of conservation for example, we had earlier this year in Budapest a joint uh, TAG meeting where taxonomic advisory groups come together and discuss uh, all kinds of aspects that have to do with a particular species. And as I spoke earlier about the WASA welfare strategy, talks about breeding programs and you know finding the balance or finding or mitigating some of the conflicts that might arise when you have breeding programs for a species versus individual welfare. So Martin and I work uh, on for example those we work together in that particular uh, conference and there are some other aspects where we are working together and together with Javiela Kier Cohen who is our director of communication and, and Janet Ho who is our membership director I work very closely on you know our membership in various regions of the world and communication 
about what happens. Uh, all these members are, a lot of these members are involved in, in welfare programs and welfare research and conservation and, and communicating about that and, and staying connected, uh, helping members who want to maybe join our Twinning for Animal Welfare program, which allows members and non-members to twin to help each other on animal welfare, moving animal welfare forward. But it also allows members to twin with non-members that are in, that are, you know, maybe looking to raising animal welfare standards. Uh, and what is really encouraging is to see that some of the really big, very progressive zoos want to enroll in this program to pair with other zoos that can help them grow. So I think it's just such a wonderful example of how, you know, facilities, how people are aware that and and really committed to always wanting to be you know the best that we can be even if we are really doing already incredible animal welfare work and uh, conservation and education to always want to keep learning and I I was um, at a student hotel many years ago and it had this little little sign and it said may the student in you never die and I think that's just such a wonderful way of looking at not just welfare but also any other aspects you know may we always question and and I think this is really great in my job I get to work with so many people from all around the world that are constantly looking at how can we you know when it comes to welfare or education or conservation all the other aspects how can we all work together uh, to make sure that we are the best that we can be sounds like a very long job description <laughs> what is it is an extremely <laughs> long uh, stroke also because it's such a collaborative job sometimes people tell me oh that must be so difficult you know because that sounds like such a huge job and it is a huge job but i i feel so supported and so it, it's such a collaborative job that I don't see it as a big job description. My, my terms of references are many, but uh, and it ha- and it covers so many different aspects. But it's such a collaborative effort that uh, it's very enjoyable and, and, of course, difficult sometimes. But that's okay. And uh, but it's extremely rewarding. And there's so many opportunities for us to do so many great things for animals, wild and under human care. So, uh, does, does, is your job description to <laughs> take the core values and go out there and do them how you collaborate with your collaborators and figure out the best way to do it or is it very clearly said in your job description do all of these things does that make sense i'm asking like are you given a pretty detailed description of what to do or is it more like you got to promote welfare and um zoos you know and you formulate the plan as you go type thing or so the job has lots of different terms of reference, but most of them come from almost all, I would say, are like from a strategic perspective. So how do we, so even though the twinning for animal welfare is a very, is a strategic approach with regards to trying to pair zoos to, you know, work on animal welfare, or it might be a university or a consultant to work uh, so creating that framework, creating a, a, a methods for people and for institutions to come together, you can also then look at, okay, so from an operational aspect, it then means these various aspects. So a lot of what we do is about, you know, strategic to operational, short to long term. So yes, the twinning for animal welfare is wonderful. Uh, capacity building in a country that maybe do- doesn't have animal welfare legislation specific to zoo animals, nor does it have animal caregiver or veterinarian education specific to wildlife is something that is great right now. But the whole idea, and that is something that is that I'm working on with, again, many of the other people is to, from a strategic perspective, look, so we do capacity building now, but how do we work together to ensure that in 10 years from now, or in 20 years from now, in particular countries where there's no appropriate education for wildlife care, veterinary or or, or curator or caregiver, can we work together to create uh, colleges, schools, courses, and, and particularly also work with local professionals and and people to make sure that there are people in that country from that country teaching animal welfare science uh, wild animal care you know in time so it's really looking at yes capacity building can happen now but how do we make sure how can we work together to create opportunities for having schools and places and courses 
that can do this in the future by local. Uh, so making it sustainable. And also how do we work together with policymakers and others to have animal welfare legislation and particularly also to wild keeping wild animals under human care in place. You know, some of these things are going to take decades to, um, to create and it might not even be in my own career, but we have to start. So some of it is operational. It's about the now because animal welfare is about the now but it's also very much looking into the future into how do we create sustainable programs uh, sustainable uh, activities and training and teaching and also how do we work towards getting legislation in place and not just the legislation but also the enforcement and uh, and monitoring of those legislations so that's just one of the examples well, as Dr. Susan Freeman says, we want to celebrate approximations. So even if they're not in our lifetime, if you take if you're starting, then that's an approximation towards that end behaviour, right? Or the end goal. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Before we do move on to talk about research, because we're going to geek out on this hard, but you do other stuff on your weekends as well. <laughs> One of them is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously we, we all have uh, personal lives and, and uh, as some of you might know, also I've, after working for 15 years as a caregiver, I have a company called Animal Concepts and I, I still have that company. I also have a partner in the company, uh, Martina Schiesel, who is currently uh, studying to become a veterinarian. And we have worked on seminars in the past together on animal welfare and also specifically also on animal training, also together with Barbara Heidenreich, which is great fun training um, Kia, for example, in Austria. So Animal Concepts is a consulting company company on animal welfare and behavior so we run this together now uh, it's really it's been wonderful working through this company for many years but now I work full-time for Waza but the company still exists and we do still organize a few events uh, like the research animal training seminar that we try to do every two or three years and uh, Martina and I have been working on that but also Kirsten um, that has she has been in, in, in Annette Peterson and many others that are in training. So we try to do, you know, we've done training and, and uh, other seminars at, for example, the Copenhagen Zoo. So we, we constantly try to collaborate. And uh, so Animal Concepts has been uh, a lot of fun and, and very rewarding and great opportunities for collaboration with many animal trainers and other animal welfare specialists uh, worldwide. So we had a great animal training seminar also at the Taronga Zoo. I think it must be at least 10 years ago now or longer. So uh, together with, with Nick Bishop, that's where we first met. So yes, yeah, it's, it's all connected. It's a beautiful web and it's just one of the other tools and, and opportunities for us to work together to, to do as much as we can for animals. And we'll link to the Animal Concepts website from the podcast write-up as well and one of my favorite pages on the animal concepts website is learning about all of the amazing research that you have done uh, and are st still involved in moving forward i was wondering now if you could tell us a little bit about some of the research you've been involved in concerning animal welfare and conservation Yes. So research, uh, so like research projects as such, there have been many. I know that Kirsten in one of the podcasts uh, earlier has spoken about, for example, the training of the harbor porpoises, you know, train the animals to decrease stress. So that was one of the research projects we worked on together. And there were actually quite many of them, especially at the Fjord and Belt Center in Denmark, because they're the porpoises and they also have seals. Um, uh, but they are specifically trained for, you know, answering questions that are related to the conservation and the protection of the species. But there's many different projects. Some of them can be related to a lot. So my background is in marine mammals. So a lot of my papers, collaborative papers that have been published are about marine mammal welfare and not only about training. So, you know, marine mammal training, how that helps in husbandry. That's a paper that I wrote about eight years ago or something that really goes into all the husbandry and all the opportunities we have to collaborate with the animals to manage them in their daily care, but also 
uh, there's lots of these different training programs that happen that are really specifically geared to its conservation. And some of them are done uh, by myself. And, and I think I really also, it's a great opportunity to highlight a lot of the research that is happening in other zoos that are um, engaged in these programs. So Colchester Zoo has a wonderful training program with their ammo leopards to listen to the heart of the animals, the animals being trained to actually listen for heart murmurs. And this, this animal doesn't have any, but, you know, it's just one of the examples of how they are working with wild ammo leopard conservation programs to understand um, some of the physiological adaptations or or aspects that they are hearing when they're working with uh, ammo leopards in the wild. So there's a beautiful connection, I think, for many of these projects for zoos and aquaria to work together also with conservation specialists working on wild animals and their welfare and well-being. So, for example, anesthesia kits that are being used in the field when they're trying to, when they're anesthetizing animals in the field to collect all kinds of physiological and other data Data, those anesthesia kits were actually developed uh, on animals, you know, in, in zoos and aquaria. So they were tested, the animals were saved, they understood how the equipment worked. And only when that was all happy and, and well, then did those the researchers feel comfortable together with veterinarians and conservation biologists to take that equipment out to use on, on wild animals in the wild. Because, of course, there, if, if anything goes wrong, you're not near, you know, some of these wonderful animal hospitals that, that zoos and aquariums have today. So I think it's just a great way of illustrating how zoos uh, and aquaria are working with wildlife biologists and other conservationists. And some of that involves training. So Twycross Zoo uh, has a great trainer, Chris Hearn, and she has trained some of the chimpanzees to participate in research projects together with the university there, um, you know, taking mouth swaps. So there's, there's lots of these examples there. With regards to my own research, a lot of it revolves also around the human-animal interaction. So last year, uh, Dr. Jeff Hosey uh, and myself, we were in Curaçao at the uh, Dolphin uh, Academy, and we were looking at how you know the dolphins are behaving before and after swim with dolphin programs to really see, you know, because dolphins are being trained to participate in these programs, what do they think about these programs? What are some of the behaviors that they're engaging in before or after? these programs and of course will need to be followed up to understand how they uh, like the, the the programs themselves so you know as you can imagine a lot of the research is like done in small parts to um, to kind of break it down into more manageable questions um, yeah so those are maybe just some of the examples that uh, that I've been involved in and, and also you know the opportunity for us to highlight wonderful research that's being done by by zoos all across the world so are you, are you seeing an increase in this? Because we had a theme to this show, podcast episode, which is asking good questions, asking how we can always, how we can do it better. Uh, and, and this research is actually the data collection about that question. Is that appropriate way of thinking about this? We're as agents tasked with improving and, and maintaining and providing animal welfare in zoos. We've got to ask those quality questions. And this research is a tool to actually collect data. <laughs> Uh, see what those dolphins are doing before and after swims. Uh, my, my question is, are we seeing more of this happening? Do you think we're going to have more research like this in zoos over the next wee while? Uh, where are we in 2018? Where are we going with this? Yes, I think that in in general there is more research happening in zoos uh, on very many different species. So maybe... So some years ago, I can't remember exactly the publication date, but if I remember correctly, uh, Dr. Vicky Melfi published a paper on what type of publications were done uh, on which species, and it was predominantly primate-based. And now we see uh, a lot of research happening and developments happening uh, with regards to research on all taxonomic groups. So they were happening on the other uh, taxa, but a lot less. Well, also what is very interesting is that we see more and more working groups, you know, so the BIASA, for example, the British and Irish Zoo Association has 
uh, an aquarium association has an invertebrate working group. So it's not, you know, we don't just have these working groups and research only on primates or the usual suspects, as I tend to call them, the lions, the elephants, all the, um, the animals that are often in the public uh, eye. But, you know, all taxa are being looked at and critical questions are being asked about how we interact with them, what we do to them. Um, so when I say what we do to them, it's like animals are giving are given roles in zoos and aquaria. So you can have animals who have the role of being a presenter animal. They're in education, in, present, uh, in presentations and shows. And the same species somewhere else in the zoo might be an exhibit animal and that animal is on exhibit and and, and, you know, has a, maybe a very different environment. And, uh, for example, a good example is, I think, the the rat. Some zoos have beautiful rat enclosures where rats can, you know, do what rats do best. They're on a reverse night cycle and people can see really, you know, complex social behaviors and all kinds of other activities and capacities and opportunities that, you know, rats engage in as they are uh, being rats. And then within the same zoo, uh, a similar rat, the same species can be housed as a breeder animal. And these animals are breeding to be food uh, for other animals in the zoo. So same species, but very different role that we assign to them, a very different environment they live in, and also very likely very different way of how we interact with them, how we handle them, and so on and so on. So again, you know, I think animal learning and training is you know, so when we're looking about, you know, thinking about animal training, it's such a valuable tool uh, to in animal welfare in a broader context. But I keep going back to really looking at what is an animal's life like 24-7. Uh, and, you know, what is what does it mean when we assign this particular role to this species and the same species we assign a different role? What is, what is the impact on the quality of life that the animals have? And so animals that are being trained for presentations or for to be ambassador animals, what type of choices and control do they have when they're not in these programs? So... If we have birds of prey that are flying into these bird shows, then what type of methods do we use to interact with them? And then if they are not flying, are they tethered to a perch or can they are they actually out in an aviary and they can just fly about? And then when they need to do the next presentation or show, they can just fly from the big aviary out to the, the big arena. I mean, so it's like asking these specific questions about uh, or how can then training facilitate that we can have them fly in the arenas or take them out to people and also provide these quality environments for them to live in and to be with uh, other social, uh, if that's appropriate to the species, outside these activities. Uh, so it's really kind of asking those those critical questions. I would love some research on birds of prey and their... On, on their welfare surrounding how they manage. Is, is there any research being done on that, do you know? Yes, so <clears throat> so I guess, yeah, to come back to, because I, I realise I, I, I start talking and then I'm not directly answering your question. <laughs> because fine. then it's like, okay, so then, so when I, when I, when I say things like asking the questions, uh, that, that means like, asking the question as being trying to teach yourself to keep asking these critical questions of what we do and how we do it and are we doing it the best way and then also attaching research projects to that to then understand how what effects do does this have on the animal and are are we doing it the best way we can so research on birds of prey is very limited i would say i think there's great discussions right now on the methods that are being used to for example fly the birds so you know way Weight, weight management in itself is, of course, very important. We don't want animals who are too thin or who don't have a good body condition, uh, but we also don't want animals who are obese, who are too heavy, uh, who don't have good body composition. So weight management uh, is, is, is important. Uh, at the same time, we know that in animal training, the word weight management might also resonate with the fact that we are you know, weighing the animals on a daily basis and we're really keeping them at that level that they are motivated uh, 
uh, to sometimes at the hunger level. Uh, so not just the weight for flying is important, but also getting animals motivated to want to fly and also particularly want to come back. And unfortunately, or we use um, jessies, uh, we use hoods, so animals can't see anything. There's lots of these these traditions, these ways of working that we use in animal training that are not uh, be necessarily being researched. I know there's great discussions on them. People are uh, moving to training without jessies, to train without hoods, to raise animals without hoods, uh, to provide big uh, aviaries, to use positive reinforcement, uh, to not, you know, really work on that hunger level, but to actually have qualitative or quantitative research on that yet. Yeah, I haven't seen anything recently, at least uh, that I'm aware of published, but please let me know if, if you have. And I think this is true for many other animals too. I think uh, when it comes to animal training, there should be a lot more research done on, you know, how we train and what does it mean. So for example, coming from marine mammal background, uh, some years ago, I did a talk on the power of food. So the power we have over food, because we need to, of course, be very cognizant of the fact that, yes, I am focusing on using positive reinforcement. But if the animal is not doing the right behavior that I would like the animal to do, I'm not just going to give them uh, the food because I don't want to necessarily reward behavior that that I didn't ask for that there there's uh, so I think so we need to obviously then we work on you know trying to avoid animals from you know making mistakes or setting it up in a way that animals are going to be successful but at the same time I need to be very uh, aware that particularly for example in marine mammal training I would say that 95% of the food comes from the trainer's hand and is contingent upon correct behavior so if I say yes we are you know, working with positive reinforcement, it still does mean that the animal needs to do, you know, the right behaviors. So, and even when people say we're free feeding the animals, so free feeding is something that is often used in marine mammals. Uh, we just go, we go to the pool. We don't necessarily ask the animals any behaviors that are maybe jumps or fast swims or other behaviors. Um, but and, and then we just give them maybe a kilo of food uh, just for sitting there. But we do need to uh, still critically look at that and say it is not a free feed like we would do maybe in the zoo where we come with uh, a lot of, uh, you know, species specific food and we scatter it or we provide it in different ways so animals can just forage and find food when they want and as they want it. Um, the animals in a free feed, with as we as I often see it in marine mammal training, the animals are still asked to sit in a certain position in front of the trainer and not beat up the animal who is next to them, or they still have to you know eat the fish in an appropriate way. So there's still criteria related to the behavior. I'm not just free feeding the animals, saying here's the food. If you want it, you can eat it. If you don't want it, fine. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things that we do uh, in training that we don't necessarily question and we don't necessarily think about. Uh, sometimes I also say I see a lot of food being used in animal training, which is quite inefficient or quite, you know, it doesn't seem to have any value or any, or any, any, what's the word, any, um, any function it's, it seems almost like it's an automatic uh, thing we just feed three or we feed five or we we feed a handful but it doesn't seem to be really you know something thought through and I think so if if you would have to pay like a thousand euros for every piece of food that you administer would you then or that you would use for rewarding um, behavior would you then be more critical like you know when you were taking pictures with the with the when we still had film now you just take any pictures you want because well you just delete the ones you don't want and you don't really care but when we had film you know you had like 12 or 24 or 36 and you were like thinking about how am i going to use it am i going to take this picture and i think you know going back to like the overarching concept of the power over food first i think marine mammals should have more opportunities to gain access to food that are not dependent on the correct behavior asked by the trainers so and and that could be done by being more critical for example how food is used within training sessions or within shows or other activities because i see a lot of food being used that is not really 
uh, very thought through. And so that food can then be allocated to provide animals with like scatter feeds or other opportunities to access food. So and, and I'm very interested in asking those questions at looking at what we do and how we do. And is this really efficient? Is it helping, you know, animals, even though we can have another discussion on this helping animal uh, word, but is it, um, is it really you know, creating again in the concept of 24-7, the opportunities, the choices and the control. And I would love to see more research on all these various aspects that I've just jumbled into one big passion talk, as you call it. Thanks, Theresa McEwen, for that, uh, McKeon, for that phrase, passion talking. That was some beautiful passion talking, by the way. Thank you very much for that. We started off with recalled, recalling wallabies, trained emus. <laughs> And we've kind of started the answer to the final question. Sadly, we are at the end. The final question for this show, Sabrina, has us thinking forward now into the future. I say we've already kind of started it because you were just sharing with us some of the research that you'd like to see happen um, moving forward over the coming years. But can you build on this for, for the listeners of this show? As the Director of Animal Welfare for the World Association of Zoos and Aquarium, with that big job description that you ran us through earlier, all of these projects, all of these people you're meeting, all of these countries you go to, conferences you go to, what are you what are you seeing as the things that are, are musts, are needs that we have to do over the next five, ten years and beyond? So I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about well, for a long time now, but I'm speaking more openly about it for the last few years, is that, for example, when I started working with animals, I've, I've always loved animals and um, and wanted to work for animals and with them. <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily mean directly with them, but... Uh, but when I started, I actually had no, I, I actually was really bored in school and I didn't really finish school. And then I started working with animals and only went back to university much later. But I started working with animals without any any particular training. And I learned what I learned by working with animals and in different facilities. And I think that is, it's fundamental to, of course, get lots of work experience and to spend time watching animals and learning about animals in the wild or, or, or any animal that you're really working on. If you're working with dogs or horses, what, what is, what are the things that you need to know? And when I started studying, actually, I, I studied psychology and I, so I started human psychology and then I did interest have you know I had the opportunity to do more on the human animal interaction in that degree and 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 also of course learn a lot about how other animals learn and my and and then I did my masters in animal studies and I looked at at the legislation and also how caregivers work like including myself work with animals and working through animal concepts and traveling and having had the opportunity and the delight to see so many different facilities and, and having worked with animals, I more and more believe that the profession of being a caregiver or being a curator or even any other job that is related to animals, it somehow needs to be regulated. So I am a, I am a trained psychologist, but I'm not a trained zoo animal welfare professional. I became that over time. But there's very many uh, specifics that I still don't necessarily know. And if I look at that from a broader perspective, a lot of the animal welfare problems and, and challenges that I see, whether it's dealing with, you know, making sure we look at animals 24-7 across lifespan, looking at you know, undesired behaviors like maybe stereotyping or having animals who are afraid or animals who are constantly sitting indoors and looking around and they're not sure what is going to happen to them and when things will happen. Are they going to close the door? Can I go to the inside? Can I go to the outside? A lot of that to me has to do with education and understanding, you know, the basis of animal care. And specifically, there is there are many countries that have great courses, even whole degrees in, in animal management. And some of them are very specific also to zoo animals and aquarium animals. 
But I also see lots of countries where there's none and lots of countries where there is um, no opportunities for people to learn about. And, and I think these go hand in hand. If you want to work, if we look at other care professionals like nursing or nurses or teachers, uh, but also other professions like lawyers, the only regulated profession, I would say, in the zoo community, in the zoo profession is veterinarians. And as much as I I think it's important to have the practical experience and to work with animals, I more and more believe that being a zoo animal caregiver, whether you're at the junior level, senior level, moving to curator, moving to manager and other aspects, it, it should be a regulated profession. And, it, and that would be beneficial for many aspects. It would be beneficial because people get the appropriate training and people need to continue having uh, training like veterinarians need to and other professions. You need to every year, every two years, have a certain amount of points that show that you are you know, keeping up to date with the latest science, the latest best practice. And I think a lot of the... So I've kind of called them system failures, but that's maybe not the right word. But we are dealing in the animal welfare field with a lot of symptoms and the symptoms come from underlying causes. And I'm interested in how do we how do we solve these underlying causes Uh, and the cause, for example, to not. So, for example, that animals are being, you know, that are learning all the time and that they're trained, whether you like it or not, like my wallaby emu example, which is a positive example but we have many negative examples has to do with the fact that many people don't necessarily get that education when they start working with animals um or they don't get the right education or they get underpaid or very little paid because it's not a protected, it's not a regulated profession. So not just from the animal's perspective, but very much also from the from the people who work with animals, their welfare, their well-being, their quality of life. Uh, I know very many zoo caregivers that have two or three jobs to make it work because they love their animal job, but it pays terribly. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is because it's not regulated. So what I would like to see combining both educational opportunities, and I alluded to that a little bit earlier when I spoke about legislation and capacity building. But, you know, how do we how do we work together to make sure that there is animal welfare and specific to to zoos and, and aquaria to wild animals under human care education opportunities at all levels? So when you're a junior caregiver, when you move to see senior caregiver or when you move to a curator position how do you how do we make sure you can you know you you can be a great animal caregiver but you don't necessarily know how to manage animals and animal welfare problems stem from maybe pure uh, human communication when people move through the ranks uh, but are not necessarily given the 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 tools to actually operate appropriately at at that level so combining you know making sure how do we work together to get to have education and every country and and in the countries where there is education now how do we make sure we move from an agricultural you know cleaning and feeding the animals to the to the modern what does it mean to take care of animals uh, approach and how do we at the same time move to regulating this profession? Right now, people can follow a two-day course and they can call themselves animal trainers. And some people do great work, but other people are, are you know, creating uh, incredible problems. And of course, you and I and many of the people that will be listening know that, you know, animal training and becoming an animal trainer is not something that you can do in two days. But right now, there's no laws, at least that I'm aware of, that actually regulate this um, but that is one of the things that I would like to find out together with with uh, some some other colleagues is to get an o- a global overview of what type of legislation is there to protect uh, zoo animals that that enforce uh, zoo animal welfare, and then particularly what type of legislation is there related to training or to education, and how do we make those professions regulated professions both for the animals to kind of deal with the symptoms by dealing with the causes, but also very much to making it better for the people who care for animals and who work for animals uh, very hard every day. So this is, I think, two of the core aspects that I would like to see more and more collaborative work in globally uh, when it comes to animal welfare and animal training to really, you know, make sure that that we are all professionals. We're all doing work from a science perspective and from a best practice perspective. Uh, perspective uh, working for animals in the best way we can i have a 
ton of questions. I'm not going to ask them because <laughs> we've been going for a nice nerding amount of time. So I'm going to now say uh, we're going to link to everything we've talked about in the podcast write-up so you, the listener, can go to one place and easily find all of this information. Uh, and I would also like to say any final words, Sabrina, before we do wrap up. It was great. I'm so glad we had the opportunity to finally connect. And I'm really looking forward to hearing. Unfortunately, I haven't had, as I said to you, honestly, I haven't had an opportunity to listen to many of the podcasts. I know you're doing, you know, great work and great podcasts with so many of my friends and colleagues and, and also people I I'm, I'm don't necessarily directly work with and lots of different species. So I'm, I'm delighted to be, to be part of this. And uh, I really look forward to listening to others and uh, to hear more and yeah please find me on linkedin or via the wiser website or animal concepts and uh and always looking for research collaborations and exchanging and keeping talking about you know animal and of course also human uh, well-being so thank you so much for having me oh, thank you and thank you for all of the time that you've put into this episode today uh for emailing back and forth for touching base and and Credit to you. It's it's taken us a couple of months, but I've constantly <laughs> continuing to touch base with me and saying and and rescheduling and rescheduling and rescheduling and we got here and all of those reschedules were approximations that got us closer from where we started to where we are today. So thank you <laughs> so like much. I like your positive approach. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this sticker. I can turn my camera around and show you from Susan Friedman on the wall that says "Celebrate Approximations." So I never forget it because absolutely. That, uh, even if we fail, we've got more information to move forward and uh, be successful next time. So thank you for all of the things, for all of the time, for all of the effort, for all of your offerings today. We could keep going, but we are going to wrap up there. But just want to end before we do end <laughs> with some gratitude. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you so much. Everyone listening, we, of course, really appreciate you as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode you and if you are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, fun and choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the ATA Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behaviour geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone. We're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode, though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening, everyone, and you'll hear from us again soon.